Welcome to Digital Polygon's vlog. We, we playfully title Rounding Out the Edges. Uh, my name is Bill Annabelle. I'm the CEO of Digital Polygon, and we are super excited to be having our having this conversation. And I'm here today with John Doyle, our CTO and founder. Um, so John, you and I have some great conversations um, over the years, right? Because we go back a ways and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. But re real, reality speaking, we wanted to share some of the crazy loony conversations we have with, uh, with, with the world, particularly as it relates to digital transformation, um, enterprise lean agile, and uh, some of the fun stuff we we get to do each and every day. So um, with that, let's start with some introductions. John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is John Doyle, um, founder here at Digital Polygon. Uh, I created the agency uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, really with a mission to uh, enable organizations uh, around uh, the globe to uh, have larger impacts and, and change the world. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it sounds like a very grand, uh, grandiose idea, uh, but in reality, uh, we want to help organizations uh, do their work uh, better, uh, more efficiently, uh, and more scalably, so that they can have greater impacts uh, around the world, and and thus allowing us uh, to have impacts uh, around the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of me. Uh, my my. My background uh, is a technologist. Uh, I came up as a developer, uh, starting uh, actually being hired by Bill um, at, at Sapient Government Services uh, right out of college. And, uh, you know, grew up through the ranks, uh, really doing focused on Drupal development, web CMS implementations, um, and uh, did a, a stint uh, over at Acquia uh, before. Uh, becoming the CTO of a, another agency here in DC, um, and uh, and then finally uh, spinning up the agency here and and hoping to have a, a big impact on uh, on the world. Yep, Fantastic. Bill. So um, as John alluded to, we have some history. We both worked at Sapient. Um, I did hire him about 11 years ago out of college, so um, um, he's made me look good ever since. The, the, um, prior to that, I, most of my experience predominantly is in the government space, although they have some um, financial services as well as nonprofit and NGO, uh, non-government organization experience. Um, I've had the luck of working for some of the, some large integrators um, like BAE Systems. I've worked for some great consulting firms, including Accenture and ICF. I work for some vendors, including like Microsoft. Um, but ultimately, um, sort of really rounding out my experience um, when I hit this, when I hit the digital agencies working for Sapient. Later on, I ran digital services for the public sector over at ICF, um, and then started working for some smaller firms, including Creative Systems and Consulting. And now thrilled to be working again with John. Um, sometimes life comes full circle, and uh, as the COO of Digital Polygon. So um, great introductions, John. It's I'm thrilled to be working with you again. Um, what do you want to talk about today? Yeah, so uh, I thought, uh, what better to kick this off with than uh, really talking about uh, digital transformation? Uh, it's a buzzword that we all know uh, is is way overused in the market. Um, so you know, I, I, this this vlog series is is really going to be focused around uh, around the benefits of or what goes into digital transformation uh, and what what our take on digital transformation is. Um, so Bill, why don't we start with with giving uh, everyone kind of a, a definition of what digital transformation means to us um, and uh, I'll let you let you give that intro. Sure. So uh, digital, as you're alluding to John, digital transformation means a lot of things to a, a lot of different people. If you were to ask you know, the CIOs or the CEOs of five different organizations across the private and public sector, they'd give you probably distinctly five different answers, right? So I like to level set the conversation that digital transformation is actually a business transformation first, supported by a series of digital and technology um, technologies to ensure um, the success. But ultimately, it's a fundamental focus and a fundamental shift for many organizations to focus on the customer first, and then build out processes 
and then the systems to support whatever that customer is trying to achieve with it, with your organization. There's some fancy words out there called customer experience, customer journeys, all important things to understand in order to be successful in digital transformation or at least digital business transformation. Um, and uh, ultimately, understanding that it starts with the business and a fundamental shift to focus on the customer is where most of our clients are finding success in the digital transformation space. Right. So, um, you know, coming, coming into this as a technologist, uh, you know, digital transformation uh, really isn't as much about uh, the technology that you use, uh, but it, it's really about using that technology and leveraging it efficiently and effectively uh, to enable that business transformation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard the word customer centric thrown out a lot. Um, and uh, really, really being able to uh, focus all of the work that you're doing on the customer, on what they need, and uh, in order to do that in today's today's uh, today's world, uh, technology is absolutely required um, to be able to implement that. But um, you know, I think you have it right. We we have to start with the business problems, not the technical ones. Um, in order to actually make an impact on uh, and provide value to both our customers as well as their customers. Absolutely. I mean, real, the reality is most businesses are still managing are still managing leveraging 20th century business models, right? In a 21st century world, the expectations of customers nowadays, regardless of what business you're in, and this this. This isn't just the business you're in, it's also the services you provide. So if you're a government organization or a nonprofit, there is an expectation that um, I'm able to use my phone 24 seven to be able to interface with your company at any time I need to get the information, ultimately the data that I, that I want to be successful, um, either making a purchase or getting a service or whatever that might be. That said, many companies are still ill-equipped to move at that pace. Um, and really struggle to understand what their needs of their customers are. So starting at the customer using, you know, uh, user-centered design approaches, design thinking approaches, uh, many organizations are starting to make those type of investments to understand what does A, the customer want, what do they need, um, when do they need it, um, and then ultimately, how do we provide those services in a far more autom autom automated way, right? How do we remove the manual processes of yesteryear and automate them in a way that um, speeds up the process when it's all said and done? Then how do we, in, once we identify those processes, we fine tune those processes so they're optimized to meet those demands. How do we adjust our systems that actually support those processes in a way that can do so? Right. That's a lot of work. Right. It, it yeah. isn't just, um, you know, buy a system implemented in magic. It all works. There is an absolute understanding we need to know about the value we're trying to drive towards our customers. Then it's, it's understanding the processes support that journey that the customers go through as they're interfacing with us at various points in that life cycle. And then ultimately, it's about changing our systems, updating our systems, throwing out old systems, bringing in new systems, whatever it takes to meet those needs, right? So it's it's understanding value streams when it's all said and done, um, both operational, the journey and the steps that the customer goes through, plus development, the systems that support that journey that we really have to focus on with our customers in order to make them successful in this digital age. Right, right. And, um, you know, uh, on the, on the uh, operational uh, and, and technology side, right? Um, it's it's becoming ever more important to uh, really build quality into your applications because of the the how quickly the landscape is shifting now. Um, how many more tools are being leveraged in in your technology stack to to interact with your customers uh, through any medium, whether it's it's your phone, it's your email, it's your TV. Um, you know, there's there's it's a much uh, broader spectrum of, of information that you have to care about. And, uh, you know, the, the days of building uh, huge monolithic applications uh, that uh, are, are impossible to maintain and update and, and, and uh, really scale uh, beyond today's needs uh, and prepare for tomorrow uh, is really uh, a huge piece of, of 
uh, why uh, we need digital transformation on the technology side as well. I like the point you're trying to make, but I'm going to, um, can I expand it to a little bit broader, right? So technology, again, I've always said, you've heard me say this for a long time, that technology is the easy part. And I'm going to put easy in, in yeah, yeah. quotes because it's never as easy as we want it to be. But ultimately, if you understand what the requirements are, both the customer, the business, the functional, the specs, right? We can actually build system, right? Build systems very quickly because we understand what those are. Now, the problem is customers' needs change all the time. The business needs yep. change all the time. Therefore, as we are planning for those things, right? And we learned this through Scrum, some XB concepts back in the day, right? At Sapient, as we because we depended on on kind of leveraging agile approaches to be able to deliver in the digital age. Um, and at the team level, it worked really well, right? We had our PMs, our, our architects, our developers, our user experience professionals, our business analysts, all working as a single team to understand those concepts, to plan work, to estimate work, and to deliver work on an ongoing basis. Quality was there as well, right? So we built in quality from the beginning. We ensured that everyone was a part of the estimation process. Everyone understood the business requirements, the user requirements, the customer requirements. And we were able to build in quality and test as we went along. So it was something we planned for from the very beginning so that when we went live, toward, you know, whenever we went live or we did a release, we were fairly confident that it was going to work. The challenge of course is, is nowadays in the digital age, it isn't just about the development team anymore. It's really about the entire enterprise and how they interact with, an org with a customer and how do they right. provide customers. So, Getting out of the public, getting out of the public sector space, right? And you did before even I did. You now understand that there's marketing, there's advertising, there's sales, there's um, the, the development teams, there's the business teams, there's the subject matter experts, plus the developers and the and the user experience professionals. How do you deliver value to a customer when you have that many people involved in the process of providing services and garnering services, you know, to 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 the customer when it's all said and done? That doesn't bode. Agile doesn't always, Agile or Scrum, the way we were brought up doing it on the development side, um, doesn't necessarily permeate those other teams that we as developers are often interfacing with or, um, or need services from as we're doing our jobs. So, um, you know, we, I've gotten, I, I started doing a ton of research on what was out there that could start to pull together an entire organization so they could Agilely provide more value to a customer. Um, and ultimately, I, I, a few years back, I stumbled across the Scaled Agile framework. Um, and I got to admit, it was based on research. The government, believe it or not, was actually ahead of the curve. And, and I would say financial services sector as well. We're all looking at this Scaled Agile framework as a method to bring the entire organization into the planning process, um, interfacing with the customer, understanding the business needs, um, understanding the objectives, understanding what quality means across the business. And ultimately, um, really started studying it and, and, and understanding the framework and then applying the framework within the public sector. Um, and then um, brought some of that experience over to Digital Polygon once um, I came on board earlier this year. That's a good transition point here. Um, so, you know, Bill, you, you are a, a certified SAFE program consultant, SBC, uh, for, uh, for the SAFE framework. Can you give us uh, really a 60 second overview of, of uh, you know, your, you know, in layman's terms, uh, your your overview of uh, of what is safe and and or how have you how have you used it uh, in within organizations and what benefit does it provide? I'll do my best to give. You know, scaled agile is a is a pretty big yet scalable framework that pulls together some of the best practices across disciplines that I've had the, I've had, you know, being the old guy in the room, I have had a lot of experience with. So I started on the technology side and over the last 10 years have really transitioned into organizational change management. Well, the Scale Agile framework takes the best of Scrum, XP, Kanban at the team level, right? And helps them plan and then execute um, work for, you know, across teams, identifying dependencies, right? But Interwoven in all of that is organizational change management, communication, design thinking, portfolio management, um, more agile ways of planning for um, planning for work across an organization, thinking more agile. It removes the project management out of project management and inserts product management as a discipline. 
um, and right. really thinks about and really starts at the customer providing, we were talking earlier about providing value to the customer. Well, it's ultimately about ident identifying the operational value streams that customers interface with an organization, understanding that process, understanding the journey that the customers make, the processes that they go through, and then the systems that support it so that we can actually identify areas that actually work for a customer and areas that right. don't work for a customer within that operational value stream and then adjust accordingly to bring additional value to them. But what I like most about, about the framework, other than it is completely and 100% focused on the customer and providing value to the customer is the concept of the built-in quality, right? Where the entire organization, be it the marketing team or the finance team or the HR team or any of the development team supporting an effort related to digital transformation and their customer is focused on providing the highest quality work um, and, 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 and if an entire organization is a planning together and executing together with built in quality in mind, they're going to be far more successful when they're, as opposed to working independently, because we can identify dependencies across teams. We can plan for those and we can execute them as well. You know, I had, I had the privilege of taking leading safe class about three weeks ago now, uh, with, with an amazing instructor. His name was Harry Narang and, uh, you know, the, uh, it, it, it was it was really one of the best trainings I've I've ever taken in my career, uh, for multiple multiple reasons. Um, but you know what what I what I what I summed up the experience to is, you know I've as a technologist used Agile and Scrum um, in various flavors across my career, right? And this uh, safe framework is really taking that and applying it to every level of the organization, uh, as you said earlier. And, um, you know, that idea that uh, it's not just the tech teams that need to be able to pivot quickly, uh, but it's the actual entirety of the business. Uh, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't even count how many times I've seen projects continue forward after the organization knows that, that uh, the value is not there anymore. They need to, they need to make a change. And they're, they just get caught up in the bureaucracy and the inability to uh, to really shift their focus and and let go of something that they've planned for two or three or four years for. And uh, you know the 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 idea of doing that in an agile approach and and focusing on your current needs and not planning out five years in the future is uh, is is something that uh, is game changing for these organizations, right? Absolutely. Um, and you hit on a, a really, you know, uh, particularly in the government where they're looking at three to five year horizons and, and, and quite frankly, the private sector as well. Um, the reality is that's a very 20th century way of thinking. It's a very project centric way of thinking where there are definitive ends and definitive beginnings and we're planning out. But, you know, initially the, the build phase, right, as one pot of money and then the operations phase as a second pot of money. But the reality is in a product centric in a product centric methodology, much like safe, um, much like safe kind of um, highlights is because the customer's needs are changing on a regular basis and we're interfacing with the customers to understand those needs and the needs to make those changes. We have to be able to pivot on a dime. So something right. we might've been planned for yesterday may be obsolete today. And therefore we have to be able to attribute for that and to pivot viciously, right? <laughs> to actually make it happen. Um, because if we continue down the path of what we had originally planned, we're, our customers or those looking for the services we provide are going to go to someone else. Therefore, we need to be continuously interfacing with the customer, understanding their needs. We need to be planning in shorter intervals, right? Not that not, we're not planning, but we're planning in shorter intervals and understanding that these intervals, and, we, and in SAFE, they're called program increments, right? Which are roughly five iterations, five two week iterations. Some organizations do six eight week iterations, but ultimately planning out P1, uh, PI1, two, and three. PI1 is very detailed. PI2 is a little less detailed. And PI3 is higher level just because we understand that within even less than a year, six months, six months to nine months, we're actually right. understand that our understanding of the requirements, our understanding of the customer needs could change that quickly. Therefore, we plan in shorter cycles, but we still plan. And we make sure that we're complete, we're in alignment because we're not, you know, we're building in quality and quality isn't just doing automated testing or manual testing, but we're actually 
having our customers test it and giving us feedback, taking that feedback, working it back into our planning process and then adjusting accordingly. It, it really gives you the ability uh, to ease uh, to ease your transition of, of, of change. So instead of the monolithic approach where I've got uh, let's 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 use the, the name of this pod or this this video blog to uh, to account for this. Instead of me taking a hard right turn at 80 miles an hour, right? I can uh, I can take it a, across the curve uh, because I haven't planned out a five year horizon that goes like this. I've planned out you know uh, three month increments so I can actually round the corner there and and be successful and not you know run off the cliff. Yeah. Um, so if you think about, you know, those that are familiar with, that may not be, be familiar with scaled agile, but are familiar with scrum-like concepts with, let's just say two week sprints, right? right. Um, we call those iterations in scaled agile, but they're essentially the same, you know, time span. If you think about, we go through backlog grooming in a normal scrum, right? We, we, we plan our, we do our sprint planning, we execute our sprint, we do our testing, we do all the things, we, we do our development, we do our testing. Um, and at the end, we do we do some demos and we do right. a retrospective at the end to see what went well, what didn't go so well, what we can improve upon. Well, those concepts um, are embraced and safe, right? Um, they may call right. it something a little different. So a sprint is an iteration, but ultimately we're doing all those things, but we're taking it up a level. We're doing those PI planning, those program increments. We plan the same way. Now, those are longer time horizons, um, five to six of those iterations or sprints. Um, but ultimately we have a product backlog. And that product backlog um, is planned for. But what's different is, is we actually bring the business owners in and we make them estimate business expected business value based on the features we're going to develop. And I think that's a huge fundamental shift because we don't just ask them what their estimated business value is. We come at the end of the PI, right? And it's called inspect and adapt, which is really the retro for the entire PI or that last quarter of work. And... Um, we have the business owners who had prioritized their work using business value actually put the value, the value earned, right? And so they might have estimated something arbitrarily, say, at a 10, um, and they realized that once it's actually implemented, it was only a five. Well, that may change the way they, they prioritize work in the future, right? right? And that's based on feedback, and that's part of the feedback. Not, so it's not only development teams providing feedback, it's the business owners that are providing feedback. If we're really smart, it's the customers that are providing feedback so that we understand um, in real time or at least in, in shorter increments that our plan was on target or was maybe slightly off, but we're learning from it much like we do with scrum teams over the years, right? It's, it's a continuous learning curve and or continuous learning culture. Well, we now take that continuous learning culture and we, we permeate it through the entire organization. And therefore the business, the development teams, the marketing and support and, and all the other support teams, HR, finance, learning, whatever, how, depending on the size of the organization, they're all there as part of that planning process, but they're also there as part of that inspect and adapt or that retro process. So they understand that their place in the world and that the planning was successful or not as successful as we wanted, but we can adjust from that because we're getting that continuous feedback and we can adjust the next quarter of work accordingly. Um, and by doing so, you're getting this feedback at the team level, but you're also getting the feedback at the program level or the program increment level, which really changes the game for most organizations because it's forcing the entire organization to focus on providing value to the customer when it's all said and done in a high quality setting because we're measuring results, um, typical you know sprint results that development teams are, are used to, but also the business value provided to the customer, which I think is game changing. There's always, the more touch points you have, the easier it is to pivot, uh, realize that you've made a mistake or realize that you're on the right track. And uh, you know any, uh, any good agile framework is, is gonna give you the ability to do that. Um, and, you know, uh, we can, we can, we'll, we'll dive into the, the, the technical side of this and some, some follow-up vlogs here. Um, but at, at a high level, uh, making sure that your entire business can pivot, uh, more readily and, and quicker as the digital landscape changes. I mean, let's, let's take COVID for an example. Uh, if you had a three-year plan walking into January of 2020, uh, and and you didn't have an agile framework to support a, a shift in how you did business. You know, look at look at what's happened to the landscape here. Look at the people that have thrived. You take a look at 
uh, Amazon, you take a look at, at, uh, at, at Zoom and Slack and these, these technology organizations that embrace agile frameworks and, you know, Amazon, uh, what does, uh, uh, 200, 200 releases a day, uh, a minute. I need to check those facts and we'll, <laughs> we'll fix that. But, uh, you on that? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the ability to pivot, uh, on a dime and, and be able to, to make those changes to react to the market. You know, I, I think Amazon's a crazy example of, uh, of how fast they can do deployments and, and, you know, their teams being completely, uh, you know, API driven and, uh, the ability to do that. But, um, even six months, uh, last year would have been a long time to be able to make a pivot in this market, uh, given, given the, the unexpected changes. Absolutely. And let me take it to a more real scenario, right? So at the time I was working for the small business administration and my background's predominantly federal government. Um, and we had implemented, um, at the, I was in the group, the business management office within the CIO shop there. And we had implemented many of the safe principles um, in a non, it, within, within the CIO shop. And what was beautiful about it was, is that on March 13th, the last day we were all in the office, um, and then March 16th, the first day that we were all working remotely, there wasn't a lot of difference in terms of our ability to actually deliver. Um, we, we had digitized the way we managed our work, right? We were using a lot of Kanban, Scrum-based principles, you know, the, the quarterly planning concepts that we just described. Um, but not only that, if you think about small business administration, they were, they were the, the, they were the tip of the spear in terms of providing relief to, via the PPP program to small businesses. Um, right. now was it perfect? No, but you know, when, in, when in trying to enact, um, you know, hastily thrown together laws to support uh, an economy that was struggling due to the COVID response. Um, it was amazing to watch how the Small Business Administration was able to get what would typically take years worth of planning and execution to build out systems to support this new law to get it done in three weeks. Right. Three weeks, right. So yeah. the, the, it's, an, it's amazing to see how organizations that planned for executing in the 21st century were able to adapt quickly to the new, it was a new new world order in terms of right. the way they operated because traditionally everyone went to work Monday to Friday. They went in downtown into DC um, over off just Virginia Avenue. And that was how they worked. The, you know, sure, they had a telework policy, but the reality was most people weren't, were working on, in the office. Well, on, on March 16th, and I remember like it was yesterday, we were all 100% virtual. And the first question was, could, could, the, could the infrastructure, the, the VPN infrastructure, could the telework infrastructure support all those users? And that, that was the first real time you know, for most organizations that they had to test that, <laughs> test that, that, that plan in that 100, nearly 100% of their employees were working remotely. The good news is it worked. Um, right. The bad news is, is there were some parts of the organization that had not planned for executing that way on a long-term basis. Um, those that did plan leveraging scaled agile-like principles um, had a lot of success. And like I said, um, I watched the CIO shop really do uh, an amazing job of delivering brand new systems or updating existing systems to be able to support the demand that they were about to embark upon and do right. so. Um, at the fastest rate you might ever imagine the government, <laughs> right? And, and you've done government work too. Yeah. So it's a long planning process. The, the acquisition process is incredibly long. And then, you know, the planning and the execution of it can take, you know, years. It's a frustrating thing for those of us that have worked in the private sector because we know things can move quicker. But I have to give credit where credit to do where an organization was able to execute with immense pressure and immense visibility um, from the administration. Now, again, was it perfect? Absolutely not. But again, right. but ultimately, they were able to deliver services that were customer centric to try to keep small business up and running. And, and so that was all possible because they had pivoted six months earlier to a more agile framework to operating. And honestly, the teams I worked right. with had no issue other than the, you know, the, the standard, you know, I'm, I'm sick of working in these four walls every day <laughs> and I miss seeing some of my colleagues. Um, that, you know, beyond, beyond this type of interface, but ulti ultimately there was no production lost. And in some cases, production was gained when necessary because we had the flexibility built in.
we've seen our fair share of failures for long-term projects and gigantic rollouts of, of government systems. Um, you know, I think back to what, 20, 2010, 2011, 2012 with, with uh, the healthcare rollouts and uh, the mess of that multi-year planning and not being able to scale uh, for it. Um, but, you know, let's, let's, let's take that same example and pivot over to the commercial side um, you know, as a, as a business owner and trying to navigate the space of, uh, the PPP program, uh, to support the business and, and, and actually utilize that relief. Um, I can tell you that the landscape of financial institutions that were able to pivot and leverage this was, was crazy, uh, skewed. Um, there are some organizations, uh, that were only accepting, paper forms, they had to go through people on calls. And uh, you can see this in some of the later legislation that uh, they actually are, are, are stopping uh, or, or giving uh, a, a buffer window to a lot of these organizations because they couldn't keep up with the demand of the large, larger banks or, or the banks that were able to implement technology and, and scale uh, quickly to support this. And just the, the from a business perspective, uh, if you're tied down to manual processes that involve uh, 100% personal interaction, the the amount of business and and throughput that you can do uh, as an institution is is limited to really human capital, right? Um, and uh, you know I think it's a good uh, it's a good lesson for financial institutions that are not uh, embracing these new uh, frameworks and these these technologies to uh, understand the uh, I can't quantify it, but I'm sure they can the loss in revenue of not being able to to support this uh, really it's 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 a simple intake form process for collecting people's information on what the PPP loan required. Sure, and, and just to be clear and fair. The PPP program had kind of multiple phases and I'm no expert, but I remember some of the challenges, which was there were organizations, typically larger banks that already had pre-existing relationships with SBA that were at an advantage because they already had right. integrations with the back end systems required to give out loans. Right. PPP basically said, okay, we're gonna it, we're gonna we're gonna expand the amount of banks that can actually have access to to this these systems, right? Right. But, the, the implementation of that didn't go as well as some of us, some of those banks would hope. Once those, that part was all taken care of, the next biggest challenge was ultimately um, throughput, right? And it was the, right. the ability for, let's just say, legacy systems to take the demand, which they yep. were never designed for, um, sure. which also caused some of the heart. Like I said, it wasn't perfect. So some of it was the banks, the new banks in the system, in the system that were enabled by PPP to be able to give loans weren't given enough guidance, right, or enough, or enough, had enough experience working with SBA, and they were learning on the fly. Um, then it was some banks were not prepared because they were used to doing these paper forms, right? And this goes right back to knowing your customer right. and understanding what their prefer preferences are. Obviously, the banking industry as a whole has been completely disrupted um, over the last decade because of phones and because of the digital age, right? I don't think I have gone into an actual branch of a bank um, in half a decade at this point. I do all my banking on my phone. It's fantastic, right? Um, the only right. time I ever need a banking is when I need cash, which I try not to use anyway. So it's, it's I use an ATM from time to time. And those I don't have to go to a bank for. I typically can go to a, you know whatever store I happen to be hanging out in at the time. Um, that all said, an organization that is prepared to pivot as necessary as challenges, like you know, a big giant monolithic rollout of a law um, that has a time frame that's unrealistic, quite frankly. Of um, course. Credit where credit's due, not only to the SBA for the, the work that they did, but for the banks and their ability to pivot as well, because right. it, it wasn't perfect. You felt it a little bit, right, uh, at the time. Right. And, right. Um, but ultimately it, on a whole, worked itself out. It, and it, but it's a perfect business case to do an analysis of, of the organizations that were best prepared, right? Let's take the banks that already had pre-existing relationships um, with SBA out of the equation because obviously they were an advantage, but I'm talking about the ones that hadn't had a previous experience with the organization. They had to learn all the rules of the government. They had to 
update their own processes to accommodate for that. They, in right. some cases, had to digitize forms that were hard copies. The government wasn't giving, the laws weren't always as descriptive as they needed to be. So there was a little gray area, what else is new? But ultimately, um, the program was largely successful. It just took some time and I am sure, and, and I'm not belittling the pain that small businesses went through, but I think it's a great business case in terms of those that were quickly able to adjust understood the value of agile thinking in customer yep. in a customer centric view um, in terms of trying to provide value. Now that created a set of challenges for the SBA and, I'll, and this is some insider baseball, but ultimately some of the organizations that had adopted say, um, robotics process automation, for example, were overwhelming some of the servers that were intaking that information because of the speed at which the processing was happening on the bank side. So right. there had to be adjustments even there, right? So part of, you know, I, I think if a, a giant lesson learned is, is there needs to be rules of engagement, right? Much like we talk about through application programming interfaces, right? There has got to exactly. be rules of engagement so that both sides of the equation understand what is possible and what is required in order to successfully have transactions, right? So that's kind of what was probably missing throughout all of this, but ultimately is a great lesson learned that, you know, ultimately there's a lot of ways that digital transformation technologies can enable an organization, but they also can bring the receiving organization to its knees, if not planned for accordingly. John, I want to circle back on the, um, the fact that you recently took the leading safe class um, because that was the first safe class I took and I, I, I haven't taken it in about a year and a half or so. Um, so I wanted to get your take on it because I thought it was a, it was a fundamentally life-changing course in the fact, the way I looked at organizations and the application of agile and lean across an organization. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Where were you first introduced to agile and what was your experience with it? Sure. Um, I was first introduced to Agile right out of college uh, at Sapient uh, Government Services. Um, my experience was working as part of a, a development team on a large enterprise migration uh, from a homegrown CMS to uh, really a, a, a COTS solution, right? And uh, we were working across uh, with various teams, infrastructure development, uh, and uh, front end, back end, back in the day, uh, we kind of had tracks separated. Um, the process, it, it was great, um, but it was more agile fall, I think, than it was pure agile. Um, we had a, a full roadmap planned out. We knew when we had to hit a date and uh, we had a project plan, right? Um, that was, uh, that was great for the time. It was, it was kind of leading edge, uh, of what we were doing, uh, back then. And it was, it was great to be a part of an organization that embraced that mindset. And I thought it was, uh, really the best thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my, my introduction to it. Um, and I've, I've really brought that through my career, uh, everywhere I worked, um, and, and tried to implement, um, bits and pieces of it where I could. So how was Agile, and again, I called it Agile Fall. So how was it effective um, and, and, sure. and, and how was it ineffective? Sure, so uh, it was really effective in allowing us to get uh, a better grasp on what needs to be done and, and delivering uh, continual uh, improvements to the application that could be tested and validated uh, on really a, a two week basis that allows us to catch issues early that allows us to catch uh, changes and, and, and incorporate really uh, modifications to what we're building without as much of a cost. Um, where it, where it f fell down a little bit is we still had uh, a six month and eight month plan of what we're doing, what it's going to be and all the requirements documented. Um, large changes to that uh, really required rework in, in the whole system and application because they were designed for a specific purpose. Um, I guess that's, that's more on the technical side of, of, of how we structured this. 
than it is on the process side? As I recall, this was a federal government client um, that was embracing Agile really for the first time. But as we're well aware that many of the processes in the federal, federal government tend to be waterfall centric. Um, right. So it was impressive at the time in terms of their desire and adaptability to, to, to take on Agile, to trust us with those concepts. However, um, for contractual purposes, we still had to deliver more traditional project management centric um, deliverables, of course. including you know, um, requirements, traceabilities matrix and, and overarching project plans, but we did plan in iterations and we did execute um, and we did leverage you know, user-centered design concepts. And right. um, it was actually a lot of fun because it was, it was one of the first government clients I worked at that truly ad- uh, embraced it. Um, right. And, and I remember that distinctly because really that's the first time you and I worked together on the same project. So let's dig a little deeper into Scaled Agile and your introduction to it. I know you just you recently took the scale, uh, the Leading Safe course, but um, where were you first introduced to Scaled Agile and what, um, what pushed you to take this course? Sure. Um, so uh, you're the one that introduced me to it for the first time, uh, okay. really uh, last summer. Um, just in one-off conversations we were having about um, how do we uh, how do we incorporate uh, change into organizations that are uh, really resistant to it, and and how do we make these pivots? Um, I think we were talking about some of some of the challenges uh, uh, that hypothetically some of the challenges that organizations were going through, and. Uh, really some of the headaches that we had uh, on uh, on projects and uh, you introduced you know uh, safe as a way to enable organizations to pivot uh, pivot at the business level um, which really intrigued me um, you know th- there's also applications uh, around DevOps and automation that uh, I've typically had a harder time uh, selling into organizations the need and the value for um, for automation um, because they see it as an additional cost. You know, if you're looking at a project-based model, you're looking at a, uh, a a set of requirements and a fixed budget and a fixed timeline. Uh, automation is the first thing that these uh, organizations throw out the window because it's added cost that doesn't uh, directly relate to a functionality that a customer is going to use. And um, what they don't understand and what, until I took this course, I was struggling a bit to articulate is that uh, in order to be able to pivot quickly, in order to be able to provide uh, higher value to your customers and get that real-time feedback, you need to build in quality from the start. You need to automate your processes so that you can actually deliver faster, uh, better, faster, stronger. Um, and uh, you know the the leading safe class uh, gave, or the, the safe framework in general takes these concepts that I'm passionate about and that uh, I've seen organizations continually fall down because they ignore and give me a framework that I can stand on uh, to uh, to push. Uh, the value here, and actually quantify it into uh, into dollars and cents. Really, um, you know, one of the, one of the I think the the key illustrations from this, the class that really stuck with me as a technologist was uh, was the 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 chart uh, or the comparison of uh, transactional versus holding cost, and uh, being able to articulate that. Uh, the longer or, or, or the smaller batches uh, of work and, and how much it costs to deploy each batch of work uh, versus the cost of holding uh, all of these uh, pieces for a longer amount of time before getting it out uh, to a customer um, really uh, solidified some of the, the missing links that I had um, in uh, how I talk to organizations about this. So, John, I know you have a technical background. Um, however, scaled, agile, safe is really intended to be more organizational. Um, where where are we having success 
implementing SAFE um, and what teams are involved? The organization is, uh, is focused on providing uh, uh, value to their customers and a lot, setting up the framework to allow them to visualize all the work they were doing so that they can respond uh, to changes in customer sentiment or shifts in the market has been, uh, has been game changing for them. Um, we're able to deliver more, we're able to deliver faster um, and we're able, and their team, uh, especially their business owners, uh, have uh, insight into every decision that's made and every, uh, every ticket that's moving through, through the board, which is giving them the ability to prioritize against the business values they set um, and really uh, change the way their organization is operating. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to the success that, uh, that we have here. Um, and, and continuing that to, to push through more parts of the organization. Absolutely. What's been impressed me the most is the ability for the organization to see the dependencies between teams um, that weren't always there historically, um, but that are obvious now and that we plan for accordingly. So I think that's also game changing for them and is, is, is going to provide optimized way of, 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 of delivering moving forward. So listen, John, we've been at this a while now. And uh, for our first blog, this went uh, for our first blog, excuse me. Um, this has gone far longer than I anticipated, but I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the conversation. I've taken some notes on in terms of some additional topics we're going to continue to talk about. Um, our hope, as, as we've discussed, is to bring in some subject matter experts, some guest vloggers, right? Guest speakers to really um, bring in expertise to talk deep, go deep into ver various subjects. But I'm super excited. I don't know about you, but, um, you know, look out. We're we're, we're, we're we're coming to you live um, from our offices and maybe someday soon we'll be able to actually do it in person together. Right. Yeah. Uh, very excited. We're actually able to get this up and running. Uh, really just took the first step. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one thing to talk about. It's another thing to be here and doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, can't be more excited for, uh, for continuing this series. And I, I hope everyone that's, uh, that's watching has enjoyed um, you know, stay tuned for some, uh, some of the outtakes here from, uh, from this session and our first one, uh, should be good. I like it. That's the, the best parts are the outtakes. Trust me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody talk to you soon. All right. Thanks.